ago, I got interested in privatization of government, and I started studying charter schools. Um, and as I got interested in and read more, I became confused um, <laughs> by two things. The first thing is, if you look at the national debate over charter schools, it's almost binary, um, frustratingly so. Uh, people love them or hate them. You hear a lot of strong opinions. But if you look closely at the research base, it's really muddy. Um, some charter schools appear to be doing somewhat better. Some, most are about the same, and some are somewhat worse. Um, and it kind of makes you wonder why the rhetoric is so heated when the results are so muddy. But I guess maybe that's the politics of our era. Um, so um, I, was, I was confused about that. The second thing is that education researchers know that most of what determines uh, the outcomes for students are things that have outside the walls of, the, of the, the school. And yet, almost exclusively, the research base is focused on test scores. Um, and so I wanted to try and say, um, if we look beyond test scores and ask, what's happening inside schools? What, if you look at the life of a school, do you see differences um, between charter schools and public schools? Um, so uh, the, the kind of running theory was if, if charter schools are supposed to be different at all, then what happens inside the walls needs to be somewhat different, control, controlling for lots of other stuff. So um, I have a political science background, but I'm interested in, in public administration. So why as public administration folks would we expect that there would be some difference? Um, so uh, I actually think that uh, before you answer that question, you need to back up and see that this is the, the movement for charter schools is part of a larger movement for privatization across government. Um, and this has been happening since the 80s. It's an effort uh, to change sort of the means by which government is implemented. Who, what types of organizations deliver uh, government services? Um, and it's happening across all kinds of areas of public policy. This is not news probably to, to many of you if you look at things as diverse as prisons, to uh, military policy, um, even welfare policy, you're seeing privatization, i.e. the use of non, traditionally non-public forms of government to implement public policy. Um, the, the, the sort of problem with this is it creates a, a narrative of duality. On the one hand, you have the exalted private sector who gives us fun phones and apps and, and really is efficient and beautiful and does these things that are remarkably nimble. And on the other side, you have the dysfunctional uh, public sector. Um, the Department of Veterans Affairs conjures you know, a very different image than if I say Apple, right? Or, or something like that. Um, and so this is, this is a, a problem um, because really, we've known for a long time that, that organizations span a spectrum of what we might think of as publicness. Um, and, and the basic idea is that uh, the duality is, is not accurate, that if you look at organizations um, and, and what they do, it, in fact, they are somewhat public and somewhat private. Um, if I were to tell you about the Coast Guard had a contract to deliver X, Y, or Z ship, uh, or sorry, wanted X, Y, or Z ship, and they contracted with Lockheed Martin or some other shipbuilder, you know, does that make Lockheed Martin a public, you know, to what extent are they a public organization? What if all, what if 75% of their revenues come from public sector sources? So the point here is that it's complicated and the discussion about privatization in my mind uh, doesn't do much to, to advance our understanding. Um, public administration theory as, as is helpful here and that's always good. Um, so when you look at publicness and try and locating organizations, uh, the idea is you want to look at where the funding comes from. You're trying to figure out how public an organization is. Who owns the organization? Okay? And then how does control operate? Is this a market-based control mechanism? Is it a public or political control base? Um, so let me do a quick thought experiment. We're in Ohio. Um, if we had three Ohio universities, the Ohio State University, I love that the Ohio State University. Not, I don't work at Harvard College, but the Harvard College, but whatever, it's cool. You guys got the V. Um, the Ohio State University, Case Western Reserve, um, which, is a, a, which is a private, as I understand it, a, a private university, um, but a nonprofit. And then you have University of Phoenix Columbus, um, which is a for-profit higher education uh, satellite campus for larger University of Phoenix. Now, I would array them 
on the publicness spectrum in different places. The question is, would those distinctions and where they're located on that spectrum matter for how they operate? I think implicitly, the theory suggests that, that, that they should, that we might expect that a University of Phoenix operates under a different set of constraints relative to, to the OSU. Um, so I think that's the, the, the helpful thing here, is that we can say there are a gradation of differences in publicness without making it binary. Okay. So um, the PA organization, the PA lit also helps us by saying, more, even if we're not thinking about this in binary terms, for a long time we've known that managing public organizations is not simple. Okay? Um, they're hard because you have a lot of different people calling you, telling you what to do. You are, um, if you think about Trevor's job as the dean of this public, public policy school, it might be different from the dean of a public policy school that was more private. Okay? You, you, the governor or the state legislature might have more of an interest in what's happening here because there are state revenues that come here. Okay? And you think that might be somewhat different. The management, the day-to-day -day stuff, might be affected by that. Right? And so I think that's what the PA literature, one of the things that PA literature helps us understand. The second thing is that with publicness comes more red tape. This is pretty well established in the literature. Um, and that that affects how, how, how organizations operate. So with that said, what is a charter school? And how do we put them on this continuum? Um, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, they're funded uh, and, and overseen publicly. In other words, you get the charter from a public entity, and they are used, uh, and tax, re tax revenues are used to, uh, to fund them. And yet, they are privately operated. Okay? So if you think back to that publicness uh, continuum, that's the distinction, I think, at the theoretical level of why we should expect them to operate differently. There's a lot of, of sort of characterization of the, of the charter school sector. Are they for-profit, are they non-profit? Most of them are, are non-profit, okay? And so they, they might, you might think of them as kind of in that middle space between for-profit entities and, and completely public uh, schools. Um, so I guess the answer is why might we think charter schools are different is because they're less public than public schools. So that's the theoretical background here um, for, for this. Um, so, how's it going? <laughs> well, there's competing narratives, okay? Um, if, you, if you look at, at sort of ed reform people, these are people who are proponents of this, uh, things are going great. Um, you have enhanced autonomy, you have innovation, you have um, schools that are dynamic in a way that public schools aren't and can't be. Um, and so uh, I think you might see this as kind of we've achieved what, what charter schools set out to do. Um, if a school is doing poorly, they can be closed. That's a harder thing to do in, in a, with, a, with a traditional public school. Um, you, at the other end of the spectrum, you have the dysfunction. The, you've got, how is, how's the charter school sector going? How's this experiment going? It's a mess, okay? Any of you watch John Oliver? Um, a couple, of, maybe it was two summers ago, he had a piece on how charter schools are doing, and it was pretty bleak, right? There's one that, that he talked about that they're, they're, they're hurting for funding, so they operate as a nightclub after hours, and so students come in in the morning and it smells like beer and vomit, and like, just what you want for, you know, your kindergartner as they start the day. Uh, but it's not, just, um, it's not just stories, there's also research that shows that um, Turnover rates are higher amongst teachers in charter schools. Um, you hear stories about management being worse and, and, and not playing by sort of a set, a set standard rules. So you have these very polarized views about how, um, how charter schools are operating. This is one of the ironies is that people say moving outside of that public purview has actually sacrificed accountability in a way because no one knows what's happening inside. So, um, and then finally, test obsessed, okay? Um, because they are so accountable uh, by one reckoning, um, all they do is drill and kill. Here's what's gonna be on the test, learn it, test it, okay? Um, so th these are kind of the competing narratives. I wanted to try and say, if you look at teachers, uh, what do you actually see inside the school? Um, teachers, uh, we all know them. Some of them we love, um, some of them maybe not. Uh, but 
whether you love them or not, they are the street level bureaucrats. My, my early work in my career was more about street level bureaucrats. The people at the, the bottom rungs of an organization who are kind of the lifeblood and make the organization function. Okay? Teachers in schools, those are teachers. Okay? They're the ones who decide how, how students get treated, how they get tracked, how they get disciplined, things like that. Okay? This is not to say that leadership in a school doesn't matter, but teachers are the low level people who make it operate. So um, my idea was that if you look in schools and think of schools as having a teaching climate, in other words, what's it like to actually work there? And if we looked across uh, a wide array of schools, you might be able to tell whether these schools are actually functioning differently. So I define this term as the nature of a school's teaching environment. What's it like to, um, to be in that school? How are resources? How is management? Do I have autonomy? Is there a ton of red tape? Those kinds of questions. Um, so in, in, in my, my interest, I was interested in like, how much control do they have over what they do in the classroom? Um, do teachers play a role in governing the school, leading the school, making curricular decisions? Um, do they turn over more? Are they burnt out? One of the narratives is, is charter teachers are just burned out, um, and so they turn over. They turn over at much higher levels. Um, and then, one of the other things that I was interested in is charter schools originally were supposed to kind of emerge organically from communities and be connected to communities in ways that public schools were were not. And so, um, one of the one of the things I wanted is how do teachers perceive interactions with the community and with parents relative to teachers in public schools. Uh, so these are some of the things. I, I have a whole list of other things that I studied, um, but I'm not going to go into them um, for now. So um, I wrote a book about this. It's currently tearing it up on Amazon. Um, and you might think this is a book about Pac-Man or pie charts or something, but I had no, no role in picking the cover. So um, it's a, actually a book about schools. Um, I, I have a long, detailed thing I can tell you about the, the, the data and the research method that was used. Basically, there are these great federal surveys of teachers going back um, to the sort of infancy of the charter period, um, where they're nationally representative, um, and they span the whole, the, they span time and space. In addition, I had six large population study uh, surveys from six states including North Carolina, um, including uh, Tennessee, including Massachusetts, Maryland, Colorado. So pretty good geographic variation. I also thought that I would survey all the teachers in Delaware because it's small and you can do that if you live, you know, couldn't do Pennsylvania, probably couldn't do Ohio. But I reached out to all the teachers in Delaware and asked them questions. Um, so blah, blah, blah. There's a, a lot of people who responded. This covers a pretty significant period of time. Um, Oh, and this is exciting. Um, this is not in the book, but since, since the book came out, I got the new data. So hold on to your seats. I'm going to present new data about what's happening in these schools uh, as, of, as of now. Um, the analysis that I'm going to show you is basically the results of, uh, of regressions that I ran that try to control for lots of stuff. Charlie and I were talking before folks came in about how charter schools, where they're located, what they look like, are, are different in lots of ways from public schools. And so if you want to say anything intelligent about differences between the two, you need to be sure you are controlling for things like where they are located, um, poverty rates, uh, racial demographics. So all I can tell you without showing the entire sort of, was it the kimono? Open the kimono too much is um, there's a lot of control variables in the um, in the coefficients that, that I'm going to show you. Um, this the second part of the book, which I'm really not going to get into too much today, just because of time, is that the other really interesting question going on here is if the charter sector is this kind of wild west, and lots of different stuff is happening in there. What explains differences among charter schools? And so there's a few different explanations that have emerged. One is that you have for-profit and non-profit. You might expect that you'd see some differences there. Two, some are franchises. These are like the McDonald's. Uh, anyone know of any of the famous franchise charter schools? Uh, KIPP. KIPP is a, is a famous one, right? Success Academy. These are organizations that have, have proliferated across geographic spaces. And so you might think, 
it sounds kind of like a public school system, right? There's a central office controlling, so that might affect variation within the charter school sector. And then third, each state has their own charter school law, and so you might expect some differences at the state level by the type of charter law. Well, how would you ever compare charter laws across state, states and time? Well, luckily there's ed reform organizations that do that for you, and they actually go through the details of each state law and try to make, make the case of how restrictive the laws are for, for charter school providers. So, um, that's that. So our charter is different. Um, I'm going to just show you four things. Uh, teacher autonomy, red tape and paperwork, accountability, uh, and teacher leadership. Okay. So, brace yourself. Uh, so, let me, let me describe what you're looking at. These, the, the federal, these are all, today's, I'm only showing you federal survey data. So on the, on the survey, they ask teachers, how much control do you have over, in your classroom, over things like the texts that you pick? Some of you are, are professors, TAs, etc. One of the joys of our life is picking books, right? And deciding what goes on your syllabus. The power of grade school, right? I mean, that's power. Well, um, text, they ask teachers, how much control do you have over text? How much control do you have over the content of what you teach? How much control do you have over the way that you teach? How much control do you have over grading and discipline in the classroom and homework? Okay, so these are odds ratios. And basically what they show you is if it's above that one line, that means there's more autonomy in charter schools. If it's below that line, it means there's less autonomy. If the little circle has a, has, is filled in, that means it's statistically significant. We can say something about it. So let me just pause. So when you say more or less, it's more or less than, than public, schools to public schools compared to public school so teachers. That survey includes charter and public schools. Correct. Right, okay. Correct. So walk, walk me through this, or interpret that on your own. How would you interpret that? Upper left corner. <clears throat> what story could you tell about it? Pretty consistently, charter teachers have said they have more autonomy over the text that they pick. Okay, same thing for the content. Does anyone see a downward trend? I mean, I, maybe, I don't know, perhaps. But how can they do that? Have they worked in public schools before? There's no own experience, or this is self-reported, right? It's self-reported. So, and, and, and there's some there's some issue if you think about the subjective nature of like what does control mean? Yeah. And I, as a as a charter teacher, I may have selected into this school because I wanted to have more autonomy compared to the public school. Now, whether you would expect that that person would be more or less likely to say that they have autonomy is a good question. You might say they'd be a harder grade of whether they have autonomy. Whatever the case is, with any surveys, you have to assume that there's some sort of comparability across places. The, uh, grade the grade? The it, it, oh, the, the, the subject is controlled for. So all across grades, elementary, high school, middle. Um, does that? Yeah, because I presume that there's limited risk freedom in certain grades and certain topics. There were. There, that was binary. That was, there, that? There, well, it's a huge survey. So there's. And it was in multiple. Have multiple uh, teachers in a single building, or is it? Yes, yes, there are multiple teachers. So, so, um, and I ran this kind of trying to cluster standard errors yeah. together and, um, and and things like that. Um, but but for the most part, I use the survey weights um, that the Department of Education has determined to to, to make these uh, nationally representative. And when you use those survey weights, I had a Dickens of a time trying to. Weighted on. Say again. Charlie's question before. Weighted on national weights. No, just to be nationally representative of all of all right, teachers. Right. No, and, and there's there's well, so there's geographic controls in the model too for whether they're in an urban setting or or, or rural or, or suburban setting. I don't know if that speaks. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, mostly, I can say that these are are pretty robust to different specifications. So I tried to run this a bunch of different ways, and pretty much the, the story came out the same. Um, now, so if we're excited from the charter proponent perspective, we're excited about that. You don't see much difference at the, at the technique level or grading or discipline except for that first year of the survey. Okay? So you could tell a story here about sort of the, the newness of the sector and initially there was a little more uh, autonomy that, that decreased over time. 
okay, in these areas. And then this is quite interesting. Charter <laughs> teachers are reporting uh, less autonomy in, in terms of control over homework o over time. So, uh, so it's complicated. Two, a less complicated graph. To what extent do the duties of the uh, do, do the administrative duties of your job hinder your ability to, to teach students? That rings true. That charter teachers now are reporting less red tape in their schools relative to, to public teachers. Okay, and that stays relatively consistent over time. Although you might say I see a little upward trend there. Um, so there's that. Okay, what about accountability? In other words. If you think of accountability as like, I'll be rewarded if I do a good job, I'll be punished if I do a, a crappy job. This first question asks about whether teachers will be recognized for doing a good job in this school. And you can see for most of the, most of the data I have, there's no real difference. In the most recent um, iteration of the survey, charter teachers were more likely to agree that if you do a good job, you will be rewarded. Okay, so that was kind of interesting. Um, uh, on the flip side, the stick, which is a job security question, will you do, w w is your job threatened if you, if your students do, don't do well on tests, et cetera, et cetera. The premise of the charter sector is that you have the fire underneath you, and it's, it's usually thought to be test driven. You don't see much evidence that charter teachers were more fearful about losing their jobs relative to public school teachers. Um, now, we can talk about why that might be and, and, and things like that, but it's, I think it's kind of an interesting thing to see. All right, finally, another hard one to read, and I apologize, don't ever put up a graph like this, but uh, I thought this would be the most efficient way. This is teacher's control over, um, basically, teacher leadership in the school. Things like determining performance standards, establishing the curriculum for their department or school, determining the content of in-service, um, evaluating teachers in the school, hiring teachers, disciplining students, and then determining the budget. So on this last one, you see no differences between charter and public schools. And the other ones, I think to me, there's a pretty clear sort of downward trend in each of these in terms of the amount of control that, that charter teachers are saying more than, than public teachers. And yet, each of these is statistically significant um, in their own year. So, are charters different? Yes and no. I mean. Uh, the devil is in the details, like almost every single paper that's ever been presented in this conference room, right? Uh, in some, it's a complicated picture. Um, the good news for charter components, <laughs> there's more, there seems to be in some areas that teachers care about, more autonomy. Okay? Uh, and there's less red tape. That's not meaningless. I think that's potentially quite important. Um, uh, the, some of the things I didn't tell you, I, I did show you that they play a bigger role in their schools. Um, I didn't show this, but in each wave of the survey, they report stronger connections with, uh, with parents. Now you might say, hold on a second, if, teach, if, if students self-select into charter schools, parents who self-select into charter schools are more, are different in some way from traditional public school parents, you might expect that they would forge better, better connections. And so I tried to get at that in those big state surveys by asking teachers, how well does your school interact with parents. And in those surveys, uh, it was pretty obvious that, um, that charter teachers thought that their school did a better job of engaging with parents. Can't totally dismiss that self-selection thing, but I just wanted to, to mention that. Um, and also, I, I, didn't, I didn't get into this, in, in some of the state-by-state -state analysis, the federal government doesn't ask about testing, but in the state-by-state -state analysis, charter teachers seemed like they were less under the gun about testing. Um, relative to, to public teachers. Um, and that was quite interesting to see. Um, the book also has some interview stuff, so if you want to hear like real live teachers as opposed to just numbers and statistics, that has some of that too. Um, so, let's see, um, the bad news. Not having differences in accountability is kind of a major problem. If the idea of charter schools is to sort of push decision making downward, decentralize, deregulate, under the auspices of, of more accountability, Teachers aren't feeling that, although in that most recent survey you saw that they did feel like they'd be more rewarded. This is potentially problematic for the, for the idea of charter schools. Um, other things I didn't get into so much that uh, are really important is that these are less educated teachers, um, they're lower paid, they're less experienced, um, 
and, and so that's something to consider as, as you think about whether this is good or bad from the perspective of public policy. Um, there's also increasing research, I don't touch on this too much in the book, that charter schools are segregated relative to public schools. And there's a really vibrant debate on Twitter and other places about whether this is reenacting segregation um, again. And there's compelling points about self-segregation is different than mandated segregation, which is what charter proponents will say about this, okay? And, and, and before we dismiss either side too simply, I would encourage people to try and grapple with the fact that self-segregation means, um, and, and what this means is minority parents are self-selecting into schools that are more minority. And, and what does that mean about how we understand those schools and, and this whole phenomenon? Uh, okay, there's also a lot of ways that there were no differences, and these are not, um, these are really important too, I think. I found when you control for lots of different stuff, there weren't higher rates of turnover in charter schools. So that was, that was compelling to me. The burnout rates weren't significantly different, which is interesting because they're getting paid less and they're working more, um, but they weren't reporting feeling burnt out more. Um, they also didn't have very different, you hear stories about kindergartens that are, smell like frat houses. They didn't report differences too much with resources or facilities. All right. Um, I'm going to skip through these last ones. They're important, but just in the, in this, for the sake of time. So I said I wasn't going to say much about this, and I'm not, except to say I wasn't really, if there's a very, if there's a worse part of the book, a part that was least, less successful, I wasn't able to explain much variation within charter schools. In other words, the big three explanations that I talked to you about, profit, franchise, state law, didn't explain a lot of the variation, at least from teachers' perspective. This is both kind of a bummer, because it'd be fun to tell you the story about these things, but also, I think, important, because it tells us we need to dig deeper and think about, well, what does explain variation within the sector? And there's, this is a real good opportunity, I think, to, to try and get in there and say, well, what are the missions of some of these schools? Like, you probably are familiar with no excuses schools. I wasn't able to look at, no excuses schools are schools that would say, if you have a discipline problem, we have no excuse for that. You know, you're gonna toe the line here, or you're gonna face severe uh, problems. So I think this is a, a place where there's opportunity for more research. Uh, conclusions. Publicness does appear to matter here. I think in, in, in some ways this confirms or this aligns with aspects of public administration theory that I think are, are, have, what is helpful here as a guide in, in navigating this. Uh, but also I think that this is about trade-offs, like almost every public policy. Um, what are the benefits that come with and what are the attending drawbacks? I.e., do you want teachers in public schools who have more autonomy but maybe aren't as educated or paid or vetted? It's kind of um, Do we want kids in schools that are more similar or more different? The research shows that, that diversity and, and integration is associated with better outcomes society-wide. Um, when you go towards a movement, a movement towards choice, you, you, you might compromise some of those outcomes. Um, and then finally, and I know this is something Stefan's kind of working on, interested in, um, changing the democratic control over how schools are operated is also a fascinating question, I think. And by some, by some way of thinking about this, people have less control over their democratic institutions under a charter school system. Is that acceptable if there is some difference in how these schools are operating? Okay. Other people might say, in fact, this is an improvement in democratic sort of uh, democratic accountability because uh, now parents have more of a you know I can vote with my feet as opposed to trying to get in touch with the school board and making some change that way. Uh, so there's a lot to think about here. Um, pretty sure that's it, though. It is it. <laughs> so thank you guys. Does anyone have any questions? No. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I know that your odds ratios that you reported are they control for all different sorts of settings and geography. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I know you teach in at Haverford, so I at least live in Philadelphia. I know my experience was my, or my the feeling I got was charter schools in the city are yeah. sort of like a way for people, like parents who wanted to live in the city but replicate like, the quality 
of suburban schools. Interesting. Sort of like a little bit of gentrification going on, but like when you look at like yeah. um, urban and suburban, do you see like notable differences or does it just get washed out? Um, in terms of the quality of, of teaching climate? Uh, about like just changing outcomes in schools. Or in, do, do, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, are the users or the kids in charter schools in like the city, just the kids who would have been in suburban schools, but now they have a place to, to, to learn, or I don't know if that's it. By, by and large, I mean, it's a tough question to answer in some ways. Um, by and large, I think the experience is that they tend to be poorer, so it's not, you're not getting this kind of like um, suburban migration into cities to, for, for schools. They tend to be poorer, they tend to be um, uh, more, you know, more minority concentrated. Um, they tend to be less special education, like fewer students who have IEPs, fewer students with ELL, although that bounces around a little bit over time. Um, my sense is this is not so much replicating or re reversing white flight. I, I don't get that, that sense. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. No, no, that's but, really yeah. good. That's a, that's a lot of the narrative that I heard when I was in Philly. It's like, yeah. oh, charter schools are just like pushing in white flight, like you, like you said. Something. Okay. Yeah, no, that's not the sense I get. Just a clarifying yeah. question, maybe. Yeah. So you're looking at climate, but are you look, doing this analysis at the individual level, or are you doing it at the school level? At the individual level. But uh, to, to the point earlier, I did group teachers together and try to and average their at the school level to see whether yeah. there's also differences, and it's pretty much the same thing, same story. So you can identify a building. Oh, yeah. The federal data are, are really... And do you know the, the uh, tenure of the child? Yes. In the charter analysis, I can. I can't control for that in the main no, analysis. It's not in, no, no. Really? Which, which is another narrative that you would think, if there's sort of an institutionalization of, uh, like, like, you know, things sort of solidify over time, you would see some drop in autonomy and things like that. But I didn't see that within the charter sector. I there is good principal data. I haven't spent as much time with that. Yeah, I th uh, say again. Ten studies. So you know, so you're, you're, we'll get it here, but presuming that the administrator is being there for the like, child, and you know, mm. just that their experience with the regime or something. Like, you know, yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question. I, I, I think I, I wasn't able to get at, at this. I, didn't, I haven't done much with that, but I think it's a good idea. Um, yeah. I want to come back to the, the self-reported survey. Yes. Yeah. Now, I'm a teacher in a public school. Mm -hmm. I'm a teacher in a charter school. Mm -hmm. I'm asked the question, do you feel you have more autonomy than you would in a public school? No, that's not the how, question. How are the questions phrased? Because do you, you have autonomy? You, you, you report. Oh, so, ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good question. But if you are working, <laughs> see, I've worked at three different institutions, okay. right? Yeah. Um, if you work in three different, if you have worked in three different school districts, then you have a comparative perspective. That but would be fun to look at. Teachers have worked in one school for 30 years. How on earth can they determine what their autonomy is? Because autonomy is something that you can say about in comparison to, right? Unless they can actually say, well, gosh, I've got less autonomy because I have to be teaching to the test, say, in public schools. I know public schools in Oklahoma lost funding simply because. Uh, for three or four years in a row, they did not meet standards. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good question. What, so what is the counterfactual? Or how, yeah. If you're a teacher in a school for 20 years, how do you make sense of that, yeah. that question? Do you have autonomy? Uh, I don't have a great answer for you about how they, what, what they use. As a, <laughs> but I do, I, I guess I still fall back on this idea that it's probably somewhat meaningful just to ask someone, do you, have, do you feel like you have control over your teaching? And mm -hmm. yeah, society's changing. Um, one thing Trevor and I were talking about beforehand is like that no child left behind happens early in this in this in the development of this study, and um, the national discourse over teachers and control um, became prevalent. I mean, there's a book called Teacher Wars. Teachers have become this kind of 
folk, this lightning rod for the national debate over almost everything, right? Like how our students do, how we're doing economically, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so to what extent did that influence people's opinions? Like, oh, you know, tests are everywhere. I don't have as much autonomy as I should. I guess for the sake of this comparison, that should fall relatively equally across charters in public schools, so I wouldn't be so con concerned about that. But it's a good question. Just to piggyback, so yeah. I know you can't do teacher level panels, so the best would be if you have teachers moving from traditional public to charter or charter to traditional public, and then you have the teacher fix effects, right? And so the switchers, you can see if they perceive autonomy differently. Yep. I think you could, even though you can't do the panel, in Ohio, um, we can actually, I could tell you what proportion of teachers in a given charter school previously were in a traditional public hmm. and vice versa. And so you can see, like, if you split it up by charter schools that are populated mostly by traditional public school teachers versus not, and you can see if your results go away. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, are there any, like, national experiments we run at the state level where all of a sudden <coughs> January 1 or, you know, approval change? Oh, like yeah. conversion charter yeah. schools? Yeah, that's right. So all the conversion charter schools, they, every teacher, right, they were public before and now that. Actually, you can do that for your whole sample yeah. problem, right? The convert, you mean of, of just the charter sample? Uh, switch on time, so charters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I actually had um, I had conversions as a dummy in my charter analysis, okay. but I didn't ever do the you know this kind of time based. Um, what year did you just transfer over? Um, the other hard thing is that we don't have schools. Yeah, no, but you can, might be able to aggregate at the school level and look at a, create a panel that way. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. some of them would be almost all formerly traditional public school teachers. Yeah, yeah. Just to follow up on your yes. perceptual, can you corroborate any of this with behavioral data? So for example, you asked about your perception about changing yeah. the text. Can you see who has the authority to change that? I mean, that's just, you know, in one case you do, and the other you don't. Can you get any of that corroborated? I, I would say the, the best way I was able to corroborate that, so it, I told you guys I, I tried to contact every teacher in Delaware. In addition, I tracked them down and did some qualitative interviewing and sort of asked them, what does autonomy mean to you? And, and so I, as much as anything, that gives me some confidence about sort of triangulating whether this is a meaningful thing. And it sounded relatively meaningful, I have to say, whereas you had public teachers in Delaware, now this is just one state, uh, complaining about sort of uh, common cores being introduced, we're being in increasingly hamstrung, we can't do what we, what we, what we want to do, and charter school teachers saying, if I want to change something, I walk down to the office and talk to the administrator and it's changed the next day. So that's my, I, in terms of behavioral things, that would be fun to look at like how often text adoption changes or something like that. Is that what you had in mind? Yeah, I mean, since that was a question. Yeah, right? yeah. You said how much autonomy do you have over the text? Yeah, it might be some way to operationalize that. It's a that. question to say yeah. do you have the ability, and my guess is it's super complicated, I'm sure, because the your, du your duality of public and private, and then your examples, I think, are accurate, that it's a much more nuanced story than that. Publishing companies are probably who drives textbook choices, right? And so over time, if a charter school is viable, yeah. Pearson's going to come knocking, and so that's you know, a, another dimension of this. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder how teachers interpret that, because if you think about our own classes, like, you know, you. It's not just the, the one, it, let's say you use a textbook. It's not just that textbook, right? You can supplement it with other things. And I think, graphs. say again? No. <laughs> Mimeographs, yes. I, I remember Mimeographs. <laughs> they had a cool smell. You remember yeah, the smell? Right. Oh, I remember that smell very well. Purple hand. Um, but I wonder if they meant sort of beyond just textbook adoption, kind of like that. It, it's, it's not just text, it's like text. Uh, there's two other things that they asked them about in that question. But I like that idea of looking at like textbook adoption as like that's just an empirical check. Yeah. Yeah. So you started out by talking about how a lot of the research focused on test scores yeah. and comparing charter and public schools. So I'm just curious, bringing back to students again. Yeah. Charter schools are different in some ways. So are those the ways that matter to students? And how? That's a great question, <laughs> and, I, and I don't know the answer to it, and I don't think anyone does right now, in part because it's very hard to study students and get at, in, in that kind of way, asking them. Like, I don't know of any national surveys of students. Uh, I, I know there's national surveys of parents, uh, 
which is also important, and, and I'm doing some, some work on that too. But uh, the, the question is a good one, and the question is, does the student experience differ across these different types of schools? Um, I don't know the answer, but I think it's really important, and you should write it. Down. <laughs> so, so there are cities that have been surveying uh, parents, teachers, and students okay. every year in every school, and they publish, like uh, Milwaukee does this, for instance, New York might still do this. Um, you might be able to do it that way. That would be a really fun, fun thing to look at. In fact, in grad school, I collected a bunch of CDs with all the historical results from Milwaukee, and they're in my barn somewhere if you want them. <laughs> <laughs> Covered in horse poop yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, getting on the the differences between students at the charter and public schools. What about the teachers? So you surveyed teachers in Delaware. What yeah. do we know about? I'm just thinking about. I used to regularly volunteer at a charter school in Washington D.C. and I don't think there was a teacher there over the age of 30 the entire time I worked yeah. there. Yeah. So, are there systematic differences between? Big time. Younger, okay. less experience, less education. The fun thing is I was able to control for those things in the federal federal data, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, but that's important too. Um, I think in, in thinking about the sort of macro perspective, like the question I asked, do we want younger, less experienced teachers with more control? And uh, I don't know. I mean, in, in that school, there's probably high degree, high level of turnover, things like that. Um, the, 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 the problem with extrapolating from that to the, the, the counterfactual is another DC public school, right? And so oftentimes you'll hear really shitty stories about urban charter schools. And the counterfactual needs to be, well, what is life like in the comparable public school? Sure, like well, in this case, that school was specifically designed to serve kids who had, couldn't make it at a public school because they had failed out or they were, it was either that or juvenile detention. So they were specifically targeting a, a certain subset. But yeah, yes. but I just wondered about how it, the overall we yeah. see these big differences between the types of teachers who attract the charter schools versus those who are it, It's attracted, and it's also because any of us could go teach in a charter school tomorrow, or you could apply for one, um, because there are you know much much less regulations and fewer hoops to jump through. Um, so there's that too. Um, yeah. So it looks like in all the results. Yeah. Um, while they sometimes stay significantly different from public schools, yeah. it seems like they all move closer. The odds ratios are smaller as yeah. you go. Yep. Um, and so I think there are multiple stories you could tell, and you mentioned one where the people who got into it with certain expectations got out. So like maybe they wanted a lot of autonomy, that explains the high rating, and then they realized, oh, I don't have that much autonomy, so they're gone in later years. Yeah. Um, but I wonder, your impression of, is, is that maybe what's happening, or, I think two other alternate stories could be in kind of a dynamic process over time, this charter school debate is gigantic, they're growing and growing and growing, there's more of them, and in response, public schools more and more try to mirror charter schools. Right. Or um, are there just, did it start out as a lot of specialized charter schools where they were taking people that were gonna go to juvenile detention, so the people in that school had tons of autonomy to try and like help these kids, yeah. And now, as there are probably 10 times as many charter schools, they're just bound to look more like all the public schools. All three of those are very good stories and interesting stories. Um, I guess, um, and, and, I, and I can't really, I'm sorry, I can't speak to them necessarily, but I think that they're compelling to me in that I do think at the early sort of wild west days of the charter mm -hmm. sector, you had people getting in because they were frustrated with teaching um, at, at public schools. Um, there's, there's evidence of that in, in books that were written at that time. Okay. Um, the specialized nature of schools, I think, is also a potentially important um, explanation. I also wasn't able to control for that. Like, there's so many different types of, of charter schools that it's, it's kind of hard to say this is a specialized school um, or not. And so some of, the, some of the muddiness may be a result of that. The other point is, like, if the charter school, I always sort of laugh about, if, if that school you just described, is compared to a public, a, a, tra a traditional public school. Why would we think that that charter school would be doing better? Right. Right. I mean, it's not the point of that school. Um, so it's it's a very hard thing to compare. And the third thing you said is basically a question of institutional isomorphism, to use a fancy term. But basically, that public schools start enacting 
what charter schools are doing and, and as the sort of accountability debate gets driven into our, our school. Um, yeah, I think that's a real possible explanation for what is happening here um, as they move towards being more similar. Um, institutional ossification is the other explanation, I guess. Um, so that comes back to that question of how long the charter had been there and, and how much, how, why that wasn't a better explanation. I guess I feel more comfortable in rejecting that, but the cross sector. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting. You name like every possibility other than the one that I've had in my mind. Um, so you said that the charter schools were like the Wild West. That was coined in Ohio because we had yeah. like the worst regulation in the country in terms of charter schools. They wouldn't start anything. Um, and over time, people caught on to this. We had some controversies. And more and more regulations from the state got imposed on charter schools. And charter schools became more and more paranoid that they were going to do something wrong and started controlling what their teachers were doing a little bit more, right? And the boards were controlling what the, the, the companies were doing that they're yeah. contracted with. And um, so if you wanted to do this in Ohio, you could test because we have clear points where big accountability laws were implemented, and you could actually probably track that. Uh, in terms of at-risk schools and such, they're completely exempted from accountability, almost completely, historically, in Ohio. And just now, people are realizing that being an at-risk school is a way to avoid accountability. Uh, so uh, the electronic classroom tomorrow, the big online school, is going to shut down in the next couple of weeks, and 12,000 students have to find a place to go to school. Um, they tried to quickly convert to an at-risk school because that's how you hide in Ohio. They were just too big to do okay. it at the time. Yeah. Uh, and let me just, just um, piggyback on that a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in New Orleans right now studying schools. Uh, since, since Hurricane Katrina, just in a, in a nutshell, they basically got rid of traditional public schools and it's all charter schools now. And um, one, of, one of the interesting things that happened is they, they had two different school districts. One was called the RSD, the Recovery School District, which was pretty much laissez-faire. It was state-run, and there were no real requirements. And the other one is the traditional public school system called the Orleans Parish School Board. They are now in the process of transferring over the Recovery School District schools back to OPSB. It's now 10 years since Katrina. And so it's a real interesting question, and there's a lot of concern at the charter school level that all of this great autonomy and control we had is now going to disappear as we go. From what I can tell, OPSB is not intending to regulate them very highly. I tried to contact them to say, so can you tell me about the teachers in your, in your schools that, you've now, that you now are under your umbrella? And they said, we don't have any idea who they are. Contact the charter operators. So that didn't make me think that they know a hell of a lot of what's going on with their, with their teachers, at least. I'm sure they're paying attention to the scores that come out. I'm just curious, where do you think the politics is going about this thing? I mean, with, you know, now a lot of different types of findings that are emerging uh, from from the research that people are doing. So, and and with the new new administration and you know new approach, where do you think is going to how is going to shape over the next? Charter schools for years. for years were 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 the, this rare thing of modern the modern political age, which is bipartisan support, right? Except for teachers unions. Democrats, Arnie Duncan, the former Secretary of Education, is a huge, was a huge charter proponent. It still is. Obama was a, was a big charter proponent. Um, and so that's starting to change now. I think as the Democratic Party is becoming more focused on sort of getting to the base and, and sort of embracing the base, I think there's starting to be less uh, comfort with that. And it, as that happens, I think Charter schools are going to are going to be on the chopping block more and more because they're going to be seen as part of Betsy DeVos's sort of um, you know her 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 kit of schools and I think that that's going to be politically damaging for for charter schools. You're also going to my this is predictions, but state by state, I think you know depending on who has control of the state house, you're going to see differences based on um, whether teachers unions have a have a in with 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 the governor and legislature. So that's that's is that what you meant by the politics of it? Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested in the concept of red tape and how it's measured. Yeah. If like you measure it by the level of paperwork um, that um, school teachers need to follow. Yeah. But uh, this is like one measurement. Right. There are other right. um, variables yeah. that have more. And I'm also interested in how these three factors yeah. red tape, accountability, and autonomy um, play, yeah. interplay with each other. Yes. Um, so the first, um, you're exactly right. That there's these, there's a, the red tape literature is really great, and it's gotten really nuanced in terms of what type of red tape are you talking about? Are you talking about personnel red tape? Are you talking about um, sort of operational red tape? 
the federal data only asks that one question. Do administrative duties interfere with the job that you do as a teacher? So it's, you know, it's good in that it's kind of generic, but it's not real good in terms of, of getting specific. Um, so on my, the fun thing about when you do your own survey is you get to decide the questions. And so I did ask uh, uh, some, some other questions, but I don't think they were probably as sophisticated as they could have been in plumbing different aspects of the red tape concept. Um, the second thing you said, how these three factors work together, I can tell a story about how they work together. I don't know for sure. Uh, but I think red tape and autonomy are, are probably linked in an important way. And I think there's probably good theory and good research suggesting that. Um, that, right? One goes down, one goes up. Um, but why does not, why do we not see sort of differences in accountability? Um, one of the things I glazed over here is that if you think about accountability, um, it's driven by school leaders. I think to a large extent, they're deciding whether, how much they pay attention and, and whether they can sort of respond to the performance that they see. Um, there were no big difference between how charter teachers and public school teachers saw their school leaders. In other words, it wasn't like, hey, dynamic in charter schools. It was like, yeah, just like in public schools. Um, and so I think partly because of that, there were not big differences in accountability. That's how I explain that. Um, the one caveat I would add, and, and, and unfortunately the federal government stopped asking this question, is they did ask in 2012, how often does your principal come watch you? And whether that observation affects your, uh, whatever, end of the year evaluation. In charter schools, it, there was more of a sense of what you might think was like performance management in charter schools, which I thought is, is, is compelling, but then you say, well, why didn't we see more accountability difference in the perceptual data? And I don't know. Is this an area where you're going to continue to do work? Yeah, so I was thinking the, um, the New Orleans case might be a, an interesting follow-up. Um, I think we were talking about it this morning. One of the hard things about this study, and I appreciate you guys not for embarrassing me with that question, but is if teachers, if teachers self-select into charter schools, and parents self-select into charter schools, you can never really deal effectively with that question of self-selection. And so one of the nice things about New Orleans is if you're gonna work in a public school in New Orleans, you're gonna work in a charter school. If you're gonna be a parent, you have to send your kid to a school, you're gonna send them to a charter school. Every parent in New Orleans has to make an affirmative choice about where their kid goes to school. And so to some extent, you get rid of some of those, those hovering self-selection questions. I thought, thought that it might be fun to do some, and I'm not, this is not unique to me, a lot of people are studying this, this what's happening in New Orleans, so th that's probably where I'm going with it. But the, the, the other part of this is I, I started off saying I'm interested in street level bureaucracy, and I really, and I would encourage anyone who's interested in this to, how has privatization affected other aspects of street level bureaucracy? These are the people who do the work of the organization. I'd love to, I don't know if I'll get around to it, I think I might, but I don't know. Welfare provision? Think about it, a for-profit provider of welfare services. In Philadelphia, that's, 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 a, that's a pretty common thing now. They don't do the standard job of, of the public welfare caseworker in terms of deciding who gets welfare, but they do decide what services people get. Um, prisons, there's been a lot of research on, on privatization of prisons. It's kind of like the third rail of liberal politics right now. Like there's a lot of things liberals don't agree on, but that's one thing everyone, even Orange is the New Black had a, had a whole season on how bad prison privatization is. But if you look at the, the stuff that, like the research that's, been, that's done on this, it's like, it's very muddy whether private prisons are as bad as, as I'm a liberal, as we liberals think. Um, and so I'd love to know what the experience is of being a private prison guard relative to being a public. Now, getting prison guards to talk to you, <laughs> what about, um, military, you know, thinking about Blackwater, if you are what used, the firm that used to be known as Blackwater, it's like Prince, right? What is, what are they called now? XE, I think, is what they're called now. Um, how do you feel as an agent, are you an agent of Blackwater if you're standing in Afghanistan guarding a hotel with the authority to shoot and kill? Are you an agent of the U.S. government? Are you an agent of Blackwater? I think they, they, those kind of areas of inquiry are really interesting to me, and I, I, I don't know how you would study it, but I, but I, but I may try to. Yeah. Uh, 
Good, so I'm going to make a pitch. You did a nice job at the beginning of sort of disabusing us of the, the public big private duality yeah. and saying there's this publicness uh, spectrum, and then you laid out funding, ownership, yeah. and, um, and what was the third? Control. Uh, in control. Um, studies in this field tend to focus on control. Yeah. A little bit on ownership and very little on funding. Yeah. And funding may be one of the most determinative factors about performance, operations, et cetera. Now, at the street level, you may have let, you know, that may be a unit level decision, mm -hmm. but it's certainly an area worthy of inquiry. I don't know the education space mm -hmm. enough, mm -hmm. but it's a place that we don't spend enough time as scholars thinking about. We run to red tape, we run to, yeah. you know, we ask you perceptual yeah. questions about yeah. how much. When the conversion of resources may matter more, like yeah. how, how much authority, or what can you do to transform the, the provision of resources into operational decisions. And, and, I, and I also just one additional pitch. Again, I think you were doing a nice stylistic portrayal of, here's the negative views of charters, here's the positive views of charters. Firms will often tell you that public organizations broadly have an advantage because they can access a bigger tax base, mm -hmm. right? And so we often juxtapose Publics are less, you know, they're more constrained, they have less ability. Well, if you're yeah. operating across a giant tax base, you you have a huge source of revenue that even with the private markets, you can't get in the private sector. Similarly, you may have political authorities that are granted to you by virtue of being a public entity that a private firm doesn't have. Yeah. We tend to ignore those things in our research because we're kind of still driven by the rhetoric around these investigations. Yeah. So yeah. as you dive into more of yeah. those, I really do think if there's a way to unlock the funding stream, yeah, uh, because the money flows in different ways. And you could tell a few different stories about it, right? I mean, one of the stories is charter schools are 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 have access to the the um, grant the grant world, the philanthropic world, in a way that public schools don't. There's an outfit at University of Arkansas that's diving into the numbers and they've done really from what I can tell pretty good work the hard part is they're funded by the Walton Foundation and I don't know I mean I know um, some people in the in the in the education reform world see that critics of ed reform will see that well they, they cook in the books or from what I can tell they're doing a pretty good job right yes. people know the Walton fund that's like from Walmart um, and so yeah um, but I think you're right uh, and I and I, I, I appreciate the suggestion um, and I also like the point about management. Management, it's not clear that, that like public management is that much worse off. In some ways, they're, they're, they're better off. But, I, but I think as a whole, do, would you agree with that, that the way PA usually characterizes them is that you're more? It's overly ideological, okay. right? I think it fits a particular kind of political narrative to the, okay. to the detriment of thinking about categorically how are they different. Yeah. And you're drawing from Rainey here, who I yeah. think does a really systematic, comprehensive job yeah. of laying out all those dimensions. As a field, we tend to be more tied up in the, the rhetoric of we face multiple principles yeah. Yeah. when, no, there's certain advantages to sure. being a member of the public sector that give you, uh, that may, may differentiate you on the one hand from the private sector, but may enhance your, your and, abilities. And think about how public opinion affects private corporations in much the same way. You know, you think public opinion affects what public organizations do, but corporations now are subject to immense uh, sure. control by what is a political form of control of public opinion. And that's really, I think, one way that, that, that we're operating. So I appreciate the sure. On that note, no thank you very much, Dr. Scott. Yeah. A reminder, again, we won't have a colloquium next week, but the week after that, send out an announcement for that. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we have, uh, uh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I didn't eat anything. Well, so is, is it you? Are you coming? Yeah, I'm coming. Okay.